Um, Jörg is from Mesosphere, works on Mesosphere's product ECOS and also Apache Mesos. He's based in Hamburg. Can we get a big round of applause for Jörg, please? Thank you very much. We actually, we've been talking already quite a lot and I'm sure we will talk more about microservices and what it actually takes to turn our application into microservices. I actually, I want to speak a little bit about what does it mean for like our infrastructure layer underneath? What does it mean for like my data center, which I want to run? So that we actually, that we don't end up with something like in this picture where our entire container infrastructure is falling over. So this is what this talk is gonna be about. Me, already been introduced. Uh, I'm a distributed systems engineer, and at Mesosphere, that actually means that I work on the Apache Mesos, the open source project, and this is what I do most of my time when I'm not here at conferences or giving workshop at customer sites. Let's actually start, and let's just look back. What was the uh, history? Why do we actually need this change? In the beginning, computing was actually rather simple. We had like one big monolith, which maybe was such kind of system, and also like our application stack, it was rather simple. We had hardware, maybe this big box we saw in the previous picture, we had some operating system on top, and then actually our application running there. Quite simple. Then actually, nowadays we're dealing a lot with microservices. I won't even try to properly define it. I basically, I just had my, my main definitions, which are important to me. Those are the words in bold. And in my opinion, the most important characteristics of microservices, whatever other definitions you might want to use, is that they actually provide well-defined interfaces between each other against another team, can use this interface and actually program against that. And the second component, and there we come more to the infrastructure layer below, is actually that they are designed to be individually flexible and scalable. That means in this old world where I had my big monolithic application, I actually I had to go in and scale this entire application. I had to duplicate this entire stack of whatever I was having because I just had this one big monolithic application. With microservices, I can actually go here in and I can identify the bottleneck, which of the services do I actually need to scale, which ones do I might need to scale in turn because I was scaling the other one, but I can do that on a per service level and I don't have to scale my entire stack. And if we now look at the application landscape, if we start out, it actually, it looks like much better already. So we have actually a distributed infrastructure with multiple machines. Those could be virtual machines. Those can be physical machines running on some kind of infrastructure. This infrastructure can be my local on-prem data center. It can be AWS. It can be Google Cloud. It can be Azure. Uh, doesn't really matter. And on top, I have like several on each machine, I have my operating system, and then I run like all my services on top. What, what are the problems we're experiencing with that? And this is, I like to describe it as dependency hell, where basically I need to determine which of the services can I run on which of those machines. And examples for dependencies are, for example, Python 2 versus Python 3. On which machine do I have which Python version available? Uh, or different Java versions, and so on and so on. So I actually, I would have to go in and figure out which service can I run on which machines. Luckily, we nowadays, we run everything in containers. And containers, for me, the main criteria are twofold. First of all, they are just a standard. If you look back at what containers means for ship, for trains, it's just a standard box I can put on either a train, on a ship, because everyone knows how to deal with that. The entire infrastructure knows how to deal with containers uh, and can just handle them no matter what's inside the container. The second thing is actually about what's inside the container. It actually it con contains the application plus all the dependencies. So I don't have to worry anymore whether there's Python 2 or Python 3 available on the machine because I actually have all the dependencies in my container. And this is what uh, is making containers pretty cool for running such kind of microservices. So 
we now introduce the container runtime to our picture. And container runtime, for most of us, this is probably Docker. Maybe just a question to the audience, how many of you have used Docker before? Or who hasn't? Oh, some, OK. So most of the time, this is still Docker, but there are actually also other runtimes people use. And we're going to see some of them later on. And this runtime, actually, it now enables us to run all those services, all our applications and containers. Pretty cool. But that actually brings us to the next problem. And this is actually that we need more. Just running a container is not sufficient. We, for example, if we look back at the early years at Twitter, when they started out using containers, what they would do, they would meet every Friday and actually count the containers running in production. So they were expecting, for example, 100 web servers running in their production environment. And over the last week, maybe five web servers had failed. And then they would go meet on Friday and actually restart five web servers and do the same thing over and over on each Friday. So this doesn't really scale from an operational point. So we actually we need more. And this is what we usually describe as container orchestration. And container orchestration, the first part is the container scheduling. Like, where can I place my containers? How can I make sure they are placed on the right hardware onto the right ships? And this is, for example, solving this problem we mentioned earlier. When a container fails, actually the container scheduling part would go in, restart that container. The second part is about, do we have the right hardware? Do we have the right hardware resources for our containers? Or maybe is this boat a little too small for our container? And so resource management, it's about where can I figure out um, how can I isolate resources and how can I make resources available to my machines? The last part, service management, this is actually about how can I interoperate between different containers? Uh, with microservices, as mentioned earlier, we don't have a single container running in our infrastructure. We have thousands to 10,000 of containers running in our infrastructure. So we need some way of figuring out uh, where they are, how ca they can interconnect. And this is the in basically what I just mentioned, just in words again. And uh, maybe one other important part, if we talk about container scheduling, you should keep in mind that it's not about just getting a single container into production and running, but it's actually over time you will have to do upgrades. You will have to switch to a new version, and that's actually also a decent container scheduler should, should support you with. So if we now look at our stack, we still have here our container runtime, but we actually we have this orchestration layer on top. And this orchestration layer, you can actually you can use several tools. So uh, we already heard about Kubernetes before. There is, um, from our side, there's something called Marathon inside DCOS, which basically takes care of this yeah, orchestration part. So pretty cool. So now we basically have our microservices figured out. But actually, in the meantime, while this entire evolution was happening, something else was happening. And this actually started out by MapReduce. So MapReduce, as actually also mentioned in the Google talk, was based on this one Google paper. And then those guys actually, um, and Yahoo especially, they made like a pretty popular open source tool, which was called Hadoop. And a lot of people, for a lot of people, Hadoop was this first tool they could actually use to analyze their data, to crunch their data, and actually to also utilize like their large clusters. So a lot of companies, a lot of research in institutes, they went in, they bought like a, one Hadoop cluster. So 10 to thousands of machines just dedicated to Hadoop. But nowadays, Hadoop is too slow. So we actually, we need to turn faster. And uh, so we're moving into this direction of fast data. So uh, here, basically, this is this yellow elephant. If you've ever seen it, this is like the mascot of Hadoop. And this is where we start out with batch processing. So we take a large chunk of data, we analyze it in one go, and then hours, maybe days later, we get our results. Um, the next iteration is basically about micro-batching, where I take really, really small batches, and I analyze them, and so I get response time somewhere between like minutes close to like tens of seconds, uh, which is already pretty good for like a large number of use cases. 
But still, if I, for example, have something like credit card fraud detection, if I'm going here and paying with my credit card in Bucharest, uh, and I would have to wait for a minute until they figure out that it's not fraud, but it's actually me paying that, that would be too slow. So I actually, I also need systems which can do event processing within microseconds, which can take each individual event, my individual credit card transaction, and figure out whether that's legitimate or not. And one popular stack for doing this is actually, it's called SMAC stack. So SMAC stands for Spark, uh, Mesos, um, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka. And a typical stack using uh, this uh, infrastructure would be, here I have my events queue. This can be some sensors, this can be me being uh, paying with my credit card, and then I usually actually have an ingestion buffer. I don't want to throw all those events directly to my analytics part, uh, which could be, for example, Spark, but I actually I want a buffer in between, which can also help me to disperse it. If you uh, have seen the talk about the Lambda architecture before, uh, you can actually also use something like this ingestion s system to come up with this Lambda architecture. So we have some message queue, which basically takes uh, messages from some producers, can buffer them, and then it's going to forward them to one or multiple consumers on the other side. In the Smack stack, the consumer is actually usually some streaming framework, some analytics framework, for example, uh, Apache Spark, or the other one which is becoming quite uh, popular nowadays as well is called Apache Flink because it's a little faster. Um, and this is an actually doing the actual analytics, figuring out uh, what results we want to get. Those results, we usually we need to store them somewhere and persist them. And a popular tool here in the open source space is uh, Apache Cassandra, which has been driven by Facebook uh, to a large degree as well. And that's actually a very scalable store. I, I'm hesitant to call it databases because I actually did a lot of work on databases. So if you want to discuss the difference why I wouldn't call it a database, just come to me later after this talk. And then we actually, this is not sufficient, we actually we also need to do something with our results and uh, throw some messages to users, trigger some kind of events. And there, Akka has become quite a popular tool because it allows to easily define multiple actors acting up on those results we just stored into Cassandra, for example. So this is our Smack stack. But what does that actually mean for our data center? So for our data center, if we look back to the time where we simply had Hadoop, as mentioned, there were a lot of customers just having like a single Hadoop cluster. Nowadays, it's not that easy anymore. But what we still see when we talk to users, when we talk to customers, is actually that they still come up with like those small subclusters. So they might have like 100 nodes in their basement somewhere. They might have 100 EC2 instances. And they're going to pick the first 21 for their analytics stack, which could be Spark, which could be Fling, or still Hadoop even. They're going to pick the next 10 nodes to, for example, uh, run something like their message queue to run Kafka. The next 10 nodes or the next five nodes they might pick to run their MySQL Galera cluster. Um, then actually maybe a large portion, about like half of the cluster, is often dedicated to those microservices, so to this container orchestration topic we were talking about before. And then there are maybe some nodes left to, for their Cassandra cluster. And this static partitioning, so basically taking individual nodes and assigning them to one workload, it actually it has multiple disadvantages. The first one being that usually utilization is really, really bad because each of those subclusters, so when I'm especially devising my microservice cluster, which usually is a tool which is like user-facing, so whenever I have too little power in that part of my cluster, uh, users are actually going to experience this they're going to have a higher latency. So that's nothing I want. So usually, I'm going to throw in like a lot more machines and a lot of additional capacity into this microservice part of the cluster. And as I have to do that basically with all parts of the cluster, so over-provision it for the maximum workload I might expect during a day, during a week, I'm actually wasting a lot of resources. The second problem is that it still involves a lot of manual operator 
um, involvement. So whenever here a node is failing in my microservice cluster, an operator might have to go in and actually pull another node out of the analytics cluster and basically redirect it to the microservice cluster so that still has enough power to serve all the customers. And uh, that, of course, is going to slow down operations department and it's nothing like an operator should really do. And this was actually uh, back in 2009. This was the idea for coming up with a system called Apache Mesos. And um, the nice part is, so it was originally developed as a class project at UC Berkeley. But then those guys actually presented it to Twitter. And how many of you remember this Twitter fail whale? It's not that frequent anymore. But basically, whenever Twitter wasn't working or still isn't working, they show like a little fail whale uh, to show they are down right now. And this fail whale actually resulted out of several parts or several problems. First of all, they simply couldn't pull in enough nodes to serve all these new customers coming in because it took them a long time to deploy stuff from testing into production. The second problem was that they actually had this utilization problem where they had a really low utilization and so they were wasting a lot of resources and it was really hard to get in enough resources to serve all those uh, customers. And so this is kind of like the vision for Apache Mesos. So, and therefore also DCS, as we're going to learn in a second. And the idea is not to treat your data center machines as individual machines, but you basically you see it as a one big pool of resources. And that's actually similar as with my laptop here. With my laptop, it has multiple CPUs. But I don't care right now which CPUs are being used to run uh, my web browser. Uh, the operating system is actually taking care of it. All I want is actually that my web browser is running and it receives enough CPU cycles. And this is actually a similar abstraction for your data center. You don't necessarily care on which machine it is running. You simply want that it's always running. And if we're talking about a data center, as this is a distributed system, uh, you actually you have to face also other problems, uh, such as failing machines, failing network, which usually doesn't happen on my laptop. I suppose that all my CPUs are working uh, usually all the time. And Apache Mesos is actually it's used by a large number of actually pretty big companies. As for example, Twitter is entirely built up on it. Uh, if you ever used Apple Siri, uh, if you ever talk to Siri, you actually also used Mesos underneath. PayPal, Airbnb, eBay, and so on. And those guys, they actually they have pretty large clusters. So it's several 10,000 nodes they're running in their data centers. And that's actually something really cool for me, being a Mesos developer, because if you get like an email from one of those guys, you just accelerated our cluster by like, I don't know, 0.5%. This is already pretty cool uh, result and uh, to get that as feedback. On the other hand, it's of course also pretty Difficult developing for Mesos because you always get feedback. You are not allowed to break Twitter. You are not allowed to break Twitter. So you're quite conservative with what kind of code you're committing. It has ups and downs. Um, What's the case for actually all those big companies is that they actually they can dedicate also large teams to, to this uh, project. And um, so they have like a team writing their own schedulers, they have their, a team taking care of networking, so uh, stuff as service discovery, load balancing, and most other companies outside those very large vendors which can afford it and which most often they actually also want to control it to that degree, they don't want to do it. And this is the idea of DCOS. DCOS basically stands for Data Center Operating System. And DCOS is basically a distribution of Apache Mesos, which gives you all those tools around. So it gives you like a UI, it gives you security, um, it's also it's open source, so anyone can just use it both on the cloud, on-prem, uh, but you don't have to figure out all those problems yourself, how you do your service discovery. It's basically it's all built around uh, this uh, core Mesos project. And that actually enables me to run both scenarios we saw before during the talk. It allows me to run those microservices. There's container orchestration built into it. And it actually also allows me to run uh, this big data stack uh, like Spark, 
Kafka, Cassandra, uh, also on top. So I'm flexible to what I want to run on top. And I'm actually also flexible like underneath, what I want to run underneath. I'm not tied into whether I run on my own data center, whether I run on the cloud, whether I run on AWS. So I can also switch and to a certain degree, come to me and talk about it because there are some pitfalls. I can also do something like a hybrid setup where I run across uh, either several zones in a cloud or on-prem and cloud data centers. Um, as mentioned before, it's uh, open source. There's a small part like enterprise features with Mesosphere selling, but the core system and everything you're going to see during the demo in a second is open source. You can just go to DCSIO, download it. There are templates if you just want to spin it up on a cloud system. And in my opinion, the nicest part is actually that there is a quite large community which is actually developing packages for it. So it's kind of like the app store for your cluster, which we're also going to see in a second. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, because uh, actually uh, last week uh, was uh, Cloud Native Con in Berlin, Germany. And it's really exciting to see how this entire container market is move, more moving towards standards. And just as one example uh, is that basically Mesos nowadays, it can actually it can run Docker images without having to invoke the Docker daemon. So how many of you have ever tried to upgrade a Docker daemon running in production minus the last version, so before the last version, um, trying to upgrade it while keeping their containers running. No one? OK. So uh, actually, when you, always, when you wanted to upgrade the Docker daemon up to the last version, what you actually had to do, you had to kill all your containers, install the new Docker daemon, and then actually you had to bring your containers back up. So this was really annoying for us, because it didn't allow us to be flexible. When we upgrade the system, we actually we need to keep it running. We cannot afford to take like all the tasks offline simply because we want to upgrade the system itself. And so this was kind of nice for us that there are now standards for the different image types, that they are standardized. There are standards for container networking. There are standards for or upcoming standards for container storage. So this is a really nice movement I'm currently seeing in this entire container space, where we are more moving to standards, allowing also third-party vendors to come up with uh, good implementations on top. And that actually brings me to the demo. Uh, I hope I sacrificed enough to the demo gods and it's all working, but let's see. Um, so this is actually the first thing you're going to see whenever you log into DCOS. And maybe what I usually like about it is the focus on the actual resources. When I scroll down, I can see that there are actually 15 connected nodes. But usually, as an operator, I don't really care about the number of nodes. I don't want to be woken up at night simply because a node failed. I want to be woken up at night because when my CPU utilization is at 99%, because that means I cannot, or the system cannot start any new task, and something is severely wrong. But just simply because a node failed, the system should take care of that by itself. The other thing I briefly wanted to show you is the so-called universe. So the universe is basically like the equivalent of an app store for your cluster. So you can actually you can go in here and with a single click install Spark, with a single click install Cassandra, Kafka, and um, then you have it running in your cluster. I can actually, I can also do the same from the CLI. So I can do DCS package install Kafka. Yes. Installing, we even get a CLI subcommand for this. And if we are switching over to our view, we actually see, yeah, now something is running on the cluster, something is happening on our cluster. Once this is done, yep, now uh, we can actually, we can also try stuff. We can check out which brokers we have. And I missed the Kafka. 
We currently, we don't have any brokers. Corsair here, as we can see, they're still starting up. But what we should already be able to see is our, our connection details. DCS Kafka connection. And this is something, I hope I'm not too fast right now. No, it's, it's all here. And th there's actually something I wanted to show you, because this is kind of important when you run on large clusters. So when we look at our uh, address details, this is basically, those are the addresses of our brokers running in the system. And I have multiple ways of addressing them. I can use the actual core IP addresses and ports to connect to them, but usually I don't want to do it, because whenever there's a failure in the system, those are going to change. The second alternative I have is actually a DNS entry. So broker0.kafka.mesos, which is resolvable from anywhere in the cluster. And that's actually going to stay static, even though the broker might fail and be restarted on a different machine. The last cool piece is actually a virtual IP, or a named virtual IP, as I only see the name here, which is basically already a load balancer across all brokers. So I can simply use that address, and it's automatically going to load balance across all brokers I have in my system. So it's kind of easy to control. So let's actually um, briefly switch back to the slides so I can tell you what kind of system we're actually trying to set up. So this demo is actually, it's a demo, it's a customer use case. The customer is called Esri. They do a lot of geospatial processing. And one use case which pretty closely matches uh, one of their real production use cases is about tracking taxis across New York City. So the setup they have, they basically, we're going to simulate some taxi data. We're going to use Spark uh, real-time analytic tasks to analyze them and figure out the location. Um, and we're going to store the results in Elasticsearch. And then actually, we're going to have a small JavaScript app to display it. And if you're looking back at the Smack stack we've seen before, this is actually almost a Smack stack. Here, we have our event sources, uh, which is like the Scala generator. Uh, we have Kafka as a message queue. We have Spark doing the real analytic work. And then simply, it's not exactly Smack. We have Elasticsearch for storing the results. And then instead of Akka, we're actually using a uh, JavaScript app. But this is the pattern we often see. People are not using the exact Smack stack, but this pattern of using those different tool chains uh, or different, uh, tool, yeah, just different areas. This is quite common across a lot of use cases. OK, let's switch back to the demo. Or let's switch back to our cluster. And what we're going to do next is actually we're going to install Elasticsearch. So for Elasticsearch, we actually we have a JSON file, which is called uh, ElasticSearchMarathon.json. Um, and I'm first going to install it, and then I'm going to show what's inside. So when I click it, it's actually it's going to create a deployment. And this deployment usually means that something is being installed on our cluster. Let's have a look what's actually inside this file. This is the definition. This is the app definition we use to start stuff. And uh, most prominently, we see what kind of resources we are addressing to it. And then the second important thing is actually a health check. A health check when developing such kind of microservice application. It's a really important pattern because the notion of health, it's kind of difficult for like a system to figure out. So actually, my application needs to kind of define it. And health checks are basically used at multiple parts of the system. First of all, they are used if this uh, stays unhealthy for, for a long time or actually here in not such a long time, because I have max consecutive failures of zero, uh, the system is actually going to restart it, because it's an unhealthy task. The second uh, way in which it's incorporated is actually by the load balancers. If I have a load balancer in my system, the redirecting traffic to Elasticsearch, similar as with the brokers we saw before and the named virtual IP, it's only going to consider 
healthy task in this load balancing. So when a service is starting up or is currently overworked because there were too many requests, it's also not considered for load balancing anymore. So it's a very useful concept. Then if we go down, we actually see here the container type. So this task is actually just a simple Docker container, the elastic search scheduler, and then we have like some ports and network settings set here. And that's basically, uh, there's not much more in this app definition. So let's have a look in the system, how far we got so far. Doesn't look too bad. Let's see whether the UI is already up. It's loading, it's slowly loading. Yeah, it's coming up, perfect. And the one thing I actually wanted to show you in this UI, because that's something really cool uh, applications can do now, I can actually, I could now scale Elasticsearch from within my application, so I can now say, I wanna have six of this, scale. And if we actually, if we now look to our dashboard, um, we see here the small increase. This was us just adding another instance because it's now coming up. So actually my application, or in technical terms, the application scheduler can actually take care of scaling itself and starting new tasks. Okay, let's start the next thing. And uh, that's actually, this is, um, I first gonna create a Kafka topic. Um, Topic create, and we are going to name it taxi because we're dealing with taxi data. Topics within Cassandra, so when I use Cassandra, as mentioned, this is this message buffer, and you can actually visualize a topic as kind of like a named pipe. So we now have a named pipe topic. Uh, a system can write into a, con a producer, and actually a consumer on the other side can pull data out. So we have a named pipe called taxi now. Um, and now we actually, we can start our real-time analytic tasks. So those are actually uh, our Spark jobs. They are simply not called Spark. S3 calls them real-time analytic tasks. And they're called red zero. So app at red zero dot JSON. And I mistyped something. So now our, uh, basically the analytics part of our pipeline is deploying, and what we need to add now is the data source, so the generator generating more data. So let's also start that. I'm not, and I forgot the add again. Uh, I'm not gonna show all the JSON definitions, but uh, actually, all of this is open source, so if you want to just check that out yourself, just go in and uh, just try it yourself. Now, the last part which is missing is the actor part, which in our case is a JavaScript application actually visualizing that kind of stuff. And uh, that's our S3 GUI here. DCS Marathon app at S3 GUI.json. Okay, now basically all the stuff is deploying in the background. We see our cluster is already pretty filled up, but let's actually just have a short look of what has started already. So let's, we see our source, it's still deploying, so we most likely not gonna see anything yet, but what I already briefly want to check out are the logs. Let's see whether we have anything in our logs already. No, logs are currently empty. This is usually, looking at the logs, this is a good sign to see when something started up. See, that's still deploying, but the GUI is already running, which is good. Let's see whether we can reach our GUI yet. Yeah, it's loading, pretty cool. Pretty slow, but cool. Yep, so we see already New York. We don't see any taxis yet, which is most likely because our data source hasn't produced any data yet. 
In terms of time, I actually, I'm just going to leave this deploying here. And uh, while that, I'm just going to switch back to the presentation. Now it's running, but probably it's still going to take some time to produce some data. So let me actually just finish the last slides in my presentation, and then we can switch back here. Because what I find really important, and this is really dear to me, is what I just showed you is basically how to keep like a POC, how to get a POC going, how to deploy the first app. But in real production scenarios, this is the easy part. This is the easy part. The hard part is actually how do you keep things running in production? And there I just want to mention some parts uh, which you should actually consider when you come up with such kind of system uh, and when you evaluate different systems. And the first things you should always be aware of is monitoring. So monitoring, it shouldn't... It's usually it's a bad sign or a bad pattern if it's done by the application itself because then your monitoring system is going to be down whenever your application uh, goes down, when DCS would go down. But um, a typical patterns in monitoring is actually to collect multiple metrics. And metrics in DCS or any container system are manifold. So you have metrics for the application itself which could be JMS, uh, JMX metrics or any other metric uh, your application is exposing. Then you have uh, container uh, uh, metrics. So container metrics could, for example, be the actual usage. So you've seen we assigned some resources like, I don't know, two gigabytes of RAM to our Docker container. And a really important metric is like how much of that RAM is being used by the container and how much is it actually ignoring or is it maybe right now at 1.99 uh, gigabyte and soon it's going to OOM and automatically be killed because we use too much uh, RAM. Uh, next part uh, you should consider for operations actually uh, logging. So what do you want to log? And you should also make sure that you log consistently. And then the big topic is always uh, whether you want to log locally or with which logs do you need centrally. So locally would mean on the same node, but that actually means your logs are gone when that node is gone. That might be fine for many applications, but for applications where you actually need central logging, you should make sure that you log to like a distributed store, which isn't taken out simply because one node failed. And also, and this is actually the same with me uh, metrics, you should make sure that your metrics are actually also uh, falling into the security constraints of your setup within your company. So if a developer is only allowed to start containers in the test environment, then most likely he should also only be allowed to see the metrics uh, of the test environment, but not the metrics of the containers running in the production environment. Then the second uh, part or second slide for, we call it day two operations because it's like after the day after you installed your entire cluster and brought up the applications to life is maintenance. So maintenance, you should consider how can I actually upgrade the cluster? And as mentioned earlier, uh, something I really hated about Docker until the last release was this requirement that I had to bring down all running containers simply because I wanted to upgrade my Docker daemon. So in most systems, I would say it's like really important that I can upgrade the system without really affecting the workload running on top of it. Uh, cluster resizing uh, and also like uh, backup and uh, re disaster recovery. So how can I do backups? How can I recover the cluster state if something is deeply going wrong? Then also troubleshooting. Whenever you deploy applications to the cluster, it's not going to go smooth all the time. You're going to have problems. So how can you debug the system itself? So how can you debug DCS? And how can you debug the actual services you are running on top of it? And there again, an important question you should ask yourself, what is the topic of ac uh, like access control? How many of you, you know Docker exec? One hand. Cool. Uh, so Docker exec actually allows me to spawn up a new task within like a container. And that actually is really useful for debugging stuff. But when I use Docker exec itself, it means I have to give the developer SSH access to the machine itself. And that also means he can actually see all Docker containers running on top, which in most, especially multi-tenant scenarios, it's going to be like a no-go 
uh, from a security point. So for example, what DCOS allows you to do, they have like DCOS task exec, which can be controlled by ACLs. And thereby, you can, for example, restrict developers to only exec into their own containers, not even caring where they run on the uh, infrastructure itself. So those are just like the points you should consider when building such kind of system, because often it's very easy to come up with a POC. You have everything running. Your CEO is happy. And uh, then you forget, and you actually run into a lot of problems uh, when actually trying to operate it. And I hope by now everything is running. Great. Let's actually see whether we also see taxis in the cluster. Yes. So now we're actually here tracking taxis in New York City, which are being generated by our data source. And that gives us actually three minutes for questions, if there are any. So every time. Uh, does anyone have any questions for you? Are you putting your hand up or taking, taking a photo? Any questions about DCOS and all the wonderfulness therein? No, none? Okay, let's get a big round of applause for York, please. <laughs>